Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started because there's a lot of stuff uh, I'd like to cover in the session. Uh, just to begin with first things, uh, my name is Mark Eckenweiler and I am an attorney. I have to admit that, you know, I'm not just an attorney, I'm a federal attorney. I'm not just a federal attorney, I'm a federal attorney with law enforcement. And it's because of the uh, respected and influential post that I have uh, that I have managed to land the coveted post-lunch speaking slot. Uh, just a couple things before we get started. Uh, I realize this is going to go very smoothly. You guys are going to believe everything that I say. There's really not going to be any sort of skepticism, uh, questioning, uh, doubt, uh, fear, uncertainty, you know, what have you. Uh, but in the unlikely event that any of you have any questions, stick up your hands, shout out, uh, because uh, this, this really is for you guys. This is not for my benefit. So if you have uh, anything other than a long-winded diatribe with no question at the end, uh, please share that with me and share it right away. I may try and defer it because a lot of questions I think may be answered further on in the talk, uh, but uh, do at least uh, give me the benefit of your question if you have one. Uh, one question I have for you guys, if I can just see a show of hands, and come on, be honest, how many of you are lawyers? Come on, okay, I see one, I see two, three. All right, okay, a few of you are willing to admit it. Um, I used to start these talks with, uh, these talks to mixed audiences with a, a lawyer joke, but I, uh, I stopped doing that because the lawyers never thought they were funny and the network folks never thought they were jokes. <laughs> so with that, um, let me get started. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, my organization. Uh, this slide does contain the one lie in my presentation. Uh, my section, I'm an attorney, as I say, a prosecutor within the computer crime section. Uh, in the criminal division at U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, actually, the lie here is we've now got about 32 attorneys. Uh, we do a whole bunch of stuff. In addition to uh, actually working on cases, we do a lot of policy stuff, training, uh, sort of going out and uh, you know, meeting with various groups, uh, a lot of speaking events. Uh, all that stuff you see there, you guys have the slides. If you turn to your hymn book, uh, it's hymn 199. Uh, you can follow along. So enough about me, where I come from. I've been with DOJ about six years. What I'd like to talk about today is, well, to begin with, I want to give you sort of an overview of this statute that I wallow around in all day long. Uh, people who work with it frequently refer to it as ECPA. It's the Electronic Communications Privacy Act of 1986. Uh, I want to talk a lot about the substance of the statute. What are the actual rules? And you know, you guys aren't lawyers in the main, so I don't expect you to go out and apply this or even to remember all of this stuff. I just want to give you a sense of how communications privacy law in the U.S. really works. And I guess my real point here is to show you what the framework looked like before October 26th when USA Patriot was signed into law last fall and what the framework looks like today. And uh, you know, I may change some minds, I may not, but to try and counteract some of the, uh, the, the, the fear mongering and I think the outright misrepresentations uh, that folks have been hearing in the press uh, over the last several months about USA Patriot. Okay, so why do you care? I mean, why would anybody even come to this other than uh, to see the funny government lawyer get up and try and defend the indefensible? Uh, because the statutes that I'm going to talk about are, in fact, the baseline. This is the stuff that protects all communications, at least all network communications, that occur within the U.S. It's this comprehensive privacy framework. It regulates the interactions among users uh, between the providers. And when I say providers, I don't just mean uh, the providers to the public, you know, the, you know, the, the OSPs, the ISPs, uh, the backbone carriers. Uh, I'm, I'm talking including uh, private companies that may have uh, corporate networks. Uh, they are also comprehended within this framework. And then from my perspective, something that matters every day in criminal investigations, this set of statutes regulates how the government can or cannot get at certain records that exist or are going to exist online. It's got civil and criminal penalties to uh, enforce uh, this entire legal regime. Uh, one caveat here, as you may know, we have this, this funny federal system in the U.S. 
where we've got federal law and then often there is state law that is layered on top of that. Uh, and this is a, uh, an example in spades of that. In addition to federal law, federal wiretap law for instance, there is a lot of state law that creates additional protections. So the most obvious example of that is in about a dozen states or so, uh, in order to record a telephone conversation, general rule is you need the consent of everybody on the call. Under federal law, one person's consent will do it. So the stuff I'm going to talk about today, because I cannot possibly be an expert in the law of all 50 states, the District of Columbia, and Guam, uh, I'm just going to stay at the federal level. State law may impose additional privacy protections on top of what I'm going to talk about today. So this is not the be-all and the end-all, but this does set the floor. States cannot go below this. Okay, why it matters to me as law enforcement, uh, I think it's sort of self-evident. Uh, just as with any other tool, people use the net to do bad things. Now, I've been on the net uh, about three times as long as I've been with law enforcement, so I know that there's lots of socially beneficial stuff that goes on. It is not a cesspool of iniquity. The net is actually, I think, a very good place. Uh, but it would, it would be deceiving oneself to say that there is not criminal conduct online or to say that law enforcement at the various levels, federal, state, and local in the U.S., does not have a role to play in combating some of that activity. What that means is there are cases where I need to get at stuff and agents need to get at stuff that is online because that is the evidence. That's the way you're going to identify uh, a particular person who is associated with conduct. Is that for me? Um, that is the way that we're going to attribute the conduct to that person and ultimately that's, that's the way that you prove up uh, to a judge or to a jury uh, that the person was culpable. And so the statutes that I'm going to talk about, as I say, uh, set the boundaries for when I can or an agent can or cannot get at that stuff that may prove up a piece of a case. Now to go back a little bit in history, uh, in 1968 Congress passed this uh, groundbreaking statute uh, often referred to as Title III. It was the third major part of a 1968 uh, bill that had a very, 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 very long name. Um, and it protected basically two kinds of communications. People talking on the phone and people sitting somewhere where they didn't think anyone else was around uh, and where they might be subject, say, to a hidden bug. Because that's really what the communications privacy threat model was in 1968. And it creates a statute, civil and criminal penalties, lots of procedural rules for when the government needs to intrude upon that privacy. Uh, and this was all in direct response to two Supreme Court cases, Katz and Berger, that were decided in 1967 and 68. That basically uh, reversed decades of precedent that said there's no Fourth Amendment uh, communications uh, protection for stuff that goes out on a wire out of your house. The, the old theory under a case called Olmstead from about 1928 was if the signal goes on a wire and leaves your house, uh, you're SOL. It's too bad. You know, it just went out into the wide, wide world and you no longer had any rights associated with that communication. Well, unsurprisingly, the, the court in 1968 decided that that was kind of a bad rule because that did not afford a lot of privacy protection for people's communications. So in those two cases, they overturned this earlier decision and said, Fourth Amendment applies, and elaborated this standard which uh, controls today under the Fourth Amendment, that basically if you have a subjective, you personally think that you ha are having a private communication, and it is one which, and this is the way lawyers talk, it is one which society is willing to recognize as reasonable, which basically means whatever a judge thinks is reasonable, um, then you have Fourth Amendment protections. And so Congress passed this entire body of law that would basically codify all the rules for that so that when prosecutors wanted to go to court to get a warrant-like order from a judge to listen in on telephone calls, that the rules would be laid out very clearly, that they would clearly comply with uh, the dictates of the Supreme Court decision so they were in fact complying with uh, the constitutional norm. 
So this worked pretty well for about a decade and a half or so. And then about the 1980s, uh, there were these new communications technologies that started to emerge. And people started wondering whether or not the statutory framework really applied to things like pagers, uh, these crazy BBS things that people were using out there, uh, uh, radio telephones, the precursors to cell phones, and so on. Uh, and in response to that, in 1986, Congress passes a statute called ECPA, Electronic Communications Privacy Act. It does a bunch of things, really not so much an overhaul of the 1968 wiretap statute as we're going to engraft some additional protections onto it. And the key one was adding a new category of communications called electronic communications. Remember we had oral, the two people sitting on a park bench with nobody around or so they think. Wire human voice across some technology medium, and that could be, and this is just the way that Congress legislates. A, a wire communication doesn't necessarily have a wire in it. Like cell phone to cell phone, you know, if all you're hitting is the tower and then it goes to some subscriber of your same carrier, that's still a wire communication because it's got human voice in it. And then this third new category to cover all these new emerging technologies, and you notice it's very technology neutral. Electronic communications, this covers fax, pager, email, uh, whatever other crazy stuff people you know, uh, could dream up after 1986. The idea was, let's see if we can't write something that will be extensible. Basically, uh, Congress wanted a statute that would scale. And so they passed uh, this amendment adding protections to those new kinds of communication technologies, uh, things that aren't going across common carriers. Um, on top of that, Let's think about the fact that with a lot of these new communications technologies, in addition to having prospective activity, I'm going to talk to somebody tomorrow and our words will flow over the telephone line, um, there is historical information that's created as a result of a lot of these transactions. We have things like email, we have things like voicemail that operate on a store and forward model. And so in addition to adding protections for wiretaps, you know, listening in in real time, Congress also added uh, a companion chapter to say, you know what, if there's stuff that's sitting around after the fact, whether it's the content or metadata, you know, when the transmission went, uh, you know, to whom, from whom, but not what it said, we're going to protect that stuff as well. Um, and then on top of that, there's also what's called the Pen Register and Trap and Trace Statute. And in 1986, what that meant was, if I want to see who is calling someone, so this is future non-content data, or who is calling a particular target telephone. We're also going to create some legal rules for that. So just by way of background, in 1986, this elaborate structure, and you'll, you'll see just how elaborate as we walk through, uh, essentially unchanged for about a decade and a half since then. There were some, some minor additions. Cordless phones got some protection uh, as part of CALEA, uh, an often demonized uh, piece of legislation, but actually offered uh, some additional privacy protections. We'll talk more about one of them uh, later on. But basically retaining the same structure, which in turn really dates back to 1968. So you've got this kind of fossil record of statutes, uh, but it really has, it has evolved. It has not undergone any sort of uh, paradigm shift uh, in the last 34 years. And then we have USA Patriot last October. And what I hope to persuade you of, or at least what I'm going to say, whether I persuade you or not, is an interesting question, uh, is that this slide right here is a list of all the sweeping new powers that the government got for criminal investigations under USA Patriot. Uh, you've all heard, undoubtedly, I mean, you've read stuff in various media outlets that will tell you about all this stuff that nobody could ever do before and how it's completely changed the face of uh, online investigations. And, uh, you know, in the famous words of Scott McNeely, you know, you have no more privacy, get over it. Um, and in fact, it's really not true. That the same framework that existed before exists today. Uh, now, there are some, it wouldn't be a meaningful piece of legislation if there weren't changes. But I would suggest to you that most of those changes were in fact in the nature of uh, codifying existing practice. So it's not really an expansion of authority, it just puts into statute what was already being done, what was already being uh, approved by the courts, or to kind of debug some uh, 
inconsistencies within the statute, and I, I think most of them are, are fairly minor. I mean, I, a lot of these really are bug fixes to the law. Um, now, as we go through, you'll see that uh, I have a, a post-fixed asterisk on a lot of stuff. That's stuff that changed under USA Patriot. So uh, as we go through, you'll see uh, which things are new and which things are old. Okay, so at this point, what I'd like to do is dive in what the rules are today and kind of talk about how it's changed uh, as a result of USA Patriot. But before we do that, because I know that your heads will hurt, maybe they already hurt, I want to give you a sense of what not just lawyers, not just judges, but federal appeals court judges have said over the years about some of these statutes. And the answer is it makes their heads hurt too. So you're in very good company if you find this stuff kind of hard to upload into your head all at once. Uh, because courts tend to deal with these things sort of on an ad hoc basis. You know, there's no ECPA court that deals with these issues all the time and so has you know, profound expertise in it. My favorite here, the, the last one, a fog of inclusions and exclusions. Uh, I think that's, that's pretty much right. Okay, here are the major categories. And this really, I think, is, is the best way. When I teach this stuff to anybody, if it's lawyers, if it's investigators, if it's uh, privacy folks, like uh, I, I talked at CFP in, uh, in April earlier this year. Uh, this is the way to break it down, to think about what kinds of information the statute addresses and how it deals with those things. There are different legal rules for each of those categories. So you can think of this really as a two by two matrix. Think of it as, are we talking about contents, and you know, we sort of know what we mean, I think, generally by the contents of a communication, although this, the uh, statute uh, helpfully defines it as the substance, purport, or meaning, uh, or non-content. All right, so that's one axis. And on the other axis, are we talking about stuff that's going to be acquired in real time? In other words, things that are going to happen in the future, or right now, you know, once I start doing stuff. Or are we talking about things that are just sitting around? They're not moving across a network, basically not bits flowing across a wire. And if you think of it in this framework, now, of course, the text of the statute really doesn't read quite so neatly. Uh, but if you kind of peer through the blizzard of statutory text, this is what Congress has done. This is what they did in 1986. And it's really the regime that, that we retain today. So if you just keep that in mind, two by two matrix, uh, you will know more about this than most attorneys who claim to practice electronic privacy law. Okay, so let's start with the biggie. Interception of communications. So real-time content collection. And this is very interesting, I think. Uh, most of the statutes that are in this whole cluster, and I, I should drop a, a footnote, you know, lawyers are very fond of footnotes. Um, when I say ECPA, I'm really referring to this whole cluster of statutes, everything in that two by two matrix. Uh, other people will use it more narrowly, but I'm just going to use it as kind of a catch all for all this stuff that's in this interrelated body of law. So, back to main text. Uh, for interception of communications, the statute starts, very intriguingly, with a default rule, a general rule don't intercept communications. Just don't do it. So, don't put bugs in people's houses, uh, don't put sniffers on people's networks, uh, including your own, and don't, um, you know, don't tap people's phone lines. And it applies to all the categories of communications. Now, that would be a very simple uh, legal regime and my talk would then be about, you know, two minutes or so. But for some sort of common sense reasons, the statute does not stop there because there are times when you want people to intercept communications and not just law enforcement, not just government. Um, before I get to that, let me talk about, you know, I mentioned earlier that there were some things that, that put teeth uh, into the statute. Uh, we got criminal penalties. Uh, typically, it's a five-year felony uh, under the federal statute. There is one, it's not really a safe harbor, it's kind of a misdemeanor exception for certain uh, wireless communications, although there is a bill pending in Congress right now, it's passed the House, that would get rid of that, uh, basically make the penalty for intercepting, say, you know, uh, analog uh, cellular telephone communications, you know, amps, uh, punishable by the same five-year uh, uh, felony provision. 
Uh, civil damages, people who are aggrieved by this, people whose calls are intercepted, can sue for $10,000 per violation, uh, plus attorney's fees. And what's new about that with USA Patriot is there was language added in uh, by uh, Rep. Barney Frank from Massachusetts, a noted conservative. Uh, uh, specifically, saying that there's a separate provision now that dings the government, the federal government, if the government engages in violations of the wiretap statute. Um, in addition to that, we've got statutory suppression. There's a provision basically that says, you know, whether or not you, you violated the constitutional rule that sits underneath this statute, uh, if you violate certain portions of the statute itself, that evidence may get tossed out by a judge. Um, a good example of that is uh, if one private party wiretaps another private party's telephone calls. Under the Fourth Amendment, because the government didn't do it, we could use that because we didn't have a hand in it, sort of a clean hands doctrine. Under the statute, uh, everywhere in the country except what lawyers call the Sixth Circuit, which is the states around Ohio, basically, um, we can't use that. If it's intercepted illegally, even if a private party did it and the government had no involvement in the interception, cannot come in as evidence. So a, a fairly stringent suppression rule that goes well beyond uh, what the Constitution requires. Okay, so as I said, uh, this stuff applies because of the 1986 amendment. This now applies to electronic communications as well as the old 1968 wire and oral things. So it's generally illegal to install a sniffer, certainly an unauthorized sniffer. Um, you know, an interesting question that has come up increasingly in the last year or so is, well, what about war driving? And the answer, uh, I think, and there's some interesting sort of nooks and crannies in the statute that uh, make this a, a fun research project. But basically, uh, I, I think war driving is probably a violation of the wiretap statute, at least if you're picking up content. And we can argue about whether SSIDs are, are content or not. Uh, but it is, it is certainly an arguable theory. So uh, you know, for those of you who are going out and doing talks and bragging about all the war driving that you've done, you know, just, just sort of be aware that you know, maybe your friend did that and you didn't. Um, <laughs> we actually, yeah. The question is, I mean, you're, you're, you're basically doing a security audit for your own network. Hold that thought, because uh, uh, let me see if I can answer that here in about two or three slides, okay? So that's the question is, is he a felon? Are, are, you, are you admitting to having done that? <laughs> okay, all right, so your friend did, so you, did, you, did you aid in a bet this conduct? <laughs> all right. Oh yeah, shoot. The, the question is, what about metadata? I'm gonna, I will get to that as well. If, if, if I haven't answered the question satisfactorily in about a half an hour, stick up your hand again, okay? Because I'll, I'll walk through each of the, What I want to do with the, the matrix that I put up there, I'm going to fill in each of those boxes as we walk through and kind of give you the legal landscape. Because as I say, there are different legal rules that go into each uh, cell in the, in the spreadsheet. Yeah? Video, typically a camera's not considered a box of video, but what if it's digitized now and this? Okay, the question is, what about video? Um, there's, there's some interesting subtleties here. Uh, let, me, let me see how we're doing for time. Uh, let me see if I can talk about that briefly. Generally speaking, if, let's say the government suspects somebody uh, in a government office of dipping into the till. They're stealing things, and so what investigators want to do is hide a camera, video only, no sound, in that space, let's say it's, a, it's an office, uh, maybe an office with a door where you know, the, the, the safe is kept, you know, petty cash is kept, whatever. Uh, it is absolutely clear that that is not covered by Title III, uh, the wiretap statute. And the simple reason is th there is no communication. It's not an oral wire or electronic communication as those terms are defined in the statute. Now, there is Fourth Amendment protection for that. And there's a whole body of case law all over the federal courts that basically says if you have a so-called reasonable expectation of privacy, then the government needs to get a search warrant. Now, you may or may not have a reasonable expectation of privacy. It's an area out in the open that's shared with lots of other people. Uh, certainly when you're at the ATM, 
there are silent video cameras there all the time. And you know, even if the government were involved in that, uh, it's not clear to me that there would be any REP, as lawyers like to say, associated with that. So silent video in one sense, if you're just talking about sticking a camera that's hidden in a room, not covered by these statutes. But an interesting question comes up about these, uh, I think they're called X10 cameras. What if I've got a little wireless connection between my camera and my PC and somebody sniffs the digitized video data as it goes through the ether? Um, I actually, I had a little argument with, uh, uh, I won't name him, an attorney from EFF about this who thought that stuff was not protected. I think it is protected because it doesn't matter that it's video, whether it's video, voice, uh, you know, IRC chat, if that, that's an electronic communication between those two points across the, 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 the ether. And in fact, I think that would be protected under the statute. Say again? It's information, well, it's a communication being, being transmitted. I think it fits the statutory definition. So um, that's a very you know, lawyerly answer, but so I'll, just, I'll just boil it down to what I always say, which is it depends. It depends on what you mean by, you know, is video stuff protected or not? Okay, let me see if I can get back here, get back on track. I'm going to you know, hold any more questions. So I said we had this general prohibition, thou shalt not intercept. But I also said it would be really dumb if we had no exceptions to that. And indeed, there are lots of exceptions built into the statute. One of them is in the category of what lawyers like to refer to as duh, which is publicly accessible systems. So if it's an open IRC channel, you know, an AOL chat room, and anybody in the world can go there, there's actually a little corner of the statute that says, you know what, you're not violating the wiretap statute if you lurk. Shock, horror, and amazement. Congress actually thought of uh, you know, a problem and, and solved it. Um, another big exception, and I'll talk about each of these, these next ones here in, in sequence uh, in greater detail. Consent of a party, one party. System provider privilege, and that goes to the gentleman over here who asked about doing a security audit on, on his own network to see if people have hung uh, you know, unauthorized wireless access points on, on the network. Computer trespasser monitoring, and then court authorized intercepts. So let's talk about each of those in turn. Consent, uh, under the federal statute, the consent of one party, and there's even a variation on this, but as a general rule, if one party to the communication consents to its interception, then it's okay. It's not a violation of the statute. And this is why you, know, you, you see, not just in movies and TV shows, but in real life, say undercover agents go into a room, they're wearing a wire, they're wearing a, uh, you know, a NAGRA, a little tiny tape recorder, and they record the conversation they have with a target. They didn't need a court order to do that because they were a party to the communication, they were physically present, and therefore it was permissible for them to intercept that communication. Um, so the consent exception, it really parallels the, uh, the, the, the Fourth Amendment requirement. There's tons of case law on this. Uh, basically, it, it, it sort of goes to that reasonable expectation of privacy issue. In the networked environment, what are the ways that you can actually get consent? Well, it could be really, really explicit. You know, uh, yes, I want to be an employee for XYZ Corp, and as a condition of employment, I agree to sign away all my privacy on the dotted line. But it doesn't have to be that explicit. Uh, consent may be uh, implied through things like you know, a login banner that a person views you know, every time they log in, uh, through terms of service that have been provided to a user of a system, you know, lots of different ways. And basically whatever the terms of that banner are uh, amount to the scope of the consent. So I agree to let you monitor you know, my web traffic, but you know, not anything that's you know, bound for any other ports, for instance. Uh, you, know, you, you can tailor it to be as broad or as narrow as you want. In fact, one of the things that we constantly deal with in my section, uh, you know, as I say, we don't just do cases. We get a lot of calls from federal agencies who say, well, what should our banners say? And the answer is, well, I don't know. What kind of rule do you want? Do you, do you want to be uh, really draconian? Would you like to be very narrow in when you're going to monitor and what you're going to monitor for? Because you can tailor it however you want. Okay, so that's consent. System operator privilege. This is a big one for you guys. Congress put in, and this goes back to 1968, and you know, if you can think back to the, the bad old days of in-band signaling on the telco networks, uh, you know, phone freaking and blue boxing, Congress said, you know what? You may monitor 
communications on your network to protect your rights or property. And you can go read in gory detail the uh, sub 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 section of 2511 that lays that out. So if you got somebody who's violated the perimeter, who's broken into your network and is noodling around, it's okay. Congress said that you're not committing a felony by monitoring that person. Um, it is pretty clear to me that this even extends proactively. You don't have to wait until you're hacked, until you're compromised. So if you want to go out and do a security audit on your network, you want to run, say, you know, one of those, what do they call it, you know, intrusion detection systems, it's okay, it's not a felony, and the people who are selling them aren't you know, selling illegal uh, interception devices. It's all right. So that's what gives you, as a system administrator, the ability to defend yourself and even defend yourself proactively. And the courts have been very, very forgiving under this. Uh, I, I hesitate to call it a not insane test, but it really is, it's pretty much a rule of reason. If you can articulate a good reason for doing what it was that you were doing, uh, the courts are gonna cut the provider slack on this front. Can that, can that information that's intercepted be disclosed to anybody, or does that have to be really disclosed to certain parties, like law enforcement? Um, our position would be, and this, uh, there's some case law to support this. There's a case called McLaren out of Florida, uh, involved the AT&T wireless uh, network from about three years ago. Uh, that basically says it is permissible to disclose. Now, it's interesting. The courts, I think, if, if you know, in this, in the keeping, in keeping with this rule of reason notion, have suggested that the disclosure still needs to be for that same purpose you know, for the protection of rights or property. The body of case law on this is blue boxer cases, where, you know, Southwestern Bell, as it used to be called, uh, you know, they, they find somebody who's stealing long distance calling service, they monitor kind of up the wazoo to, on that particular person's line, and then they wrap it all up after 30 days in a nice big bow and turn it over to law enforcement. And as long as it was reasonably related, the courts have said, well, you don't get to listen to the whole 10-minute conversation, but you can get the, the call set up, maybe the first two minutes or so, so we can do a voice attribution. We actually know who the, who the calling party is. Um, that stuff, it's a freebie. You can, you can do whatever you want with that, including give it to law enforcement, and successful prosecutions have been brought on that. And as I say, there's tons of case law in the telco context going back to uh, you know, early 1970s on that. Could you publish it in the newspaper? That's an interesting question, and uh, I don't know of any case law that suggests uh, one way or the other what the answer is. Uh, there's another exception uh, sort of closely related to that. You can intercept if it's inherently necessary to providing the service. You're running an SMTP server so that your customers can get email. Kind of another duh. Well, of course you can intercept acquire the contents of those communications because otherwise it would be wicked hard for your customers to actually get their email. So that's okay. Um, another exception, and this one's new under USA Patriot, called uh, Computer Trespasser. Let me just hold that thought if you would. Uh, and this one, this one's taken a lot of uh, slings and arrows. Uh, there, there's been a lot of uh, uh, real estate in the press devoted to how uh, inimical to all things that are true and good and private this is. Here's the problem. What rules allow government monitoring of an intruder in a private network? Um, and so let, let, let's think about what the rules were last year before USA Patriot. Consent of the system owner as property, as a party, excuse me. Well, if the system owner is a party to everything that transits its network, then I guess uh, Verizon is a party to all of my telephone calls. And if they were a party to all my telephone calls, then they could consent to anybody else overhearing them. And I think that would be bad. So uh, there, there was some concern about the notion of getting the system provider's consent to listen in on network intruders. Right to property monitoring, interesting question here. Uh, there's at least some limited case law that suggests that if the provider, when it's doing monitoring, is acting in concert with law enforcement, that it's very easy for them to step outside the limited rights or property exception, particularly if they're acting at law enforcement's direction. You have what's known in the law as an agency problem. And then, you know, the oldie but goodie, what about consent? Well, you know, as, as we know, because you guys are security experts, you can always put a banner in front of the intruder, right? So you can always get their consent. Well, obviously not. So 
because we had this odd situation where victims would come to law enforcement, they say, look, I've got this person who's intruded into my network. Uh, I want to monitor, I even want to monitor in conjunction with you, because maybe this is part of a much larger puzzle that law enforcement is working on. Uh, so let's work hand in hand. And the question was, well, did we need to go to a court and get a court order to monitor those communications? And that seemed kind of stupid because we're talking about somebody who is kind of the electronic equivalent of a burglar. Somebody who has broken into your network, got no business being there, they have no privacy rights or they should not have any privacy rights. Certainly they have no constitutional expectation of privacy. So why should they have protection under the statute? And so what was done in USA Patriot is add a new exception to address that limited circumstance. And I should add, uh, this is one of the changes to USA Patriot, which is sunset. In other words, on December 31 of 05, this goes away, unless Congress takes some action in the interim to uh, extend it or make it permanent. And what the scope of that is, we, we have a definition of uh, a computer trespasser, a person who accesses without authorization, has no reasonable expectation of privacy, and we're not talking about the misbehaving insider. We're not talking about the person in your network who's got some permission to access the network. You know him, you allow him to do certain stuff, maybe he's allowed to access this server for, for a certain limited purpose, but he's exceeded his privileges. You know, he's elevated to root or something. This doesn't apply. There are lots of ways to deal with that problem statutorily that we never needed computer trespasser for. Because among other things, you can deal with that by having things like employment agreements. You know, if it's already someone with whom you have a relationship, then you can have terms of service. You can have employment agreements and so on. So uh, with respect to Senator Feingold, who gave an impassioned speech on the floor of the Senate about how this was going to uh, lead to the FBI monitoring moms doing their Christmas shopping, you know, from their web access at work, it just doesn't apply to the misbehaving insider. It applies to the person outside who got no business uh, penetrating your network, but has done so nevertheless. Uh, some limits on this. Uh, one, this can only be done with the consent of the victim. So if the owner of the victim or the operator of the victim machine or the victim network says, you know what, I don't want you monitoring in here without a court order, that's it. That's the end. The government still wants to monitor that, maybe because this is part of some larger course of conduct. We have a choice. We can either let it go or we can go get a court order, full-blown court order. In addition, this is not the camel's nose under the tent where once you're in, you can monitor everything that's on the network. There is a specific provision in the statute that says, when you are doing monitoring under this provision, the only stuff that you can monitor under authority of this provision is the stuff to or from the trespasser. Question? What's the definition of access under this statute? Uh, that's an interesting question. There is no definition of access in the statute. Well, you, you're thinking about, you know, is a ping an access? I've seen some people claim it is. Um, it probably is, and that's one of those uh, sort of facts and circumstance problems that the courts have had to deal with for years. I mean, one ping is, uh, in my view, not an unauthorized access. Maybe 30,000 pings, or you know, maybe, maybe one malformed SIN packet is not an unauthorized access. It's an access, but you know, it's, just, it's just not big enough. To, what about a port scan? I, I tend to think not. I mean, there's often the question that arises, is a port scan a violation of law? I think standing alone, probably not, at least not under you know, federal law, Section 1030. But that's, that's sort of a separate thing. I mean, we're, we're getting a little off the, the, the wiretap statute. Um, yeah, question here? I was just going to add that uh, I happen to know from personal experience that the state of Pennsylvania seems to believe that it is actually a violation of law. The state of Pennsylvania says that port scanning is, is a violation of law. Well, they can do that. You know, they have their own government, they get to pass laws, and uh... <laughs> okay, well, but if you were scanning something in Pennsylvania, well, if your friend was scanning something in Pennsylvania, then that's, that's conduct, you know, affecting them, and so they're, you know, they're able to exercise jurisdiction over it. All right, let me see if I can pick up the pace just a little bit. I apologize, I think I've been going a little slow here. Um, I did want to dwell on this for a minute, though, because this, is, this has had a lot of rocks thrown at it. 
And the fact is, it's really a fairly narrowly tailored, it's a surgical fix for a problem that we encountered that basically slowed down investigations, inhibited investigations, and did so for no reason. Lots of times there's a good reason to inhibit investigation because you have a legitimate privacy interest. You got a Fourth Amendment privacy interest, and so we need to be going to court anyway if we want to intercept that stuff as a general rule. But this case that I'm talking about with the computer trespasser, and I think you guys probably know it when you see it. Um, there's, there's really no reason for there to be any protection, statutory or otherwise, for that. But then the other thing to bear in mind here, my first sub-bullet point here is, suppose the operator of the network is uncertain. Not quite sure, is this a trespasser, misbehaving insider, can't really decide, don't know if I want law enforcement in my network or not. Uh, and by the way, this doesn't mean that law enforcement has to come in and do the monitoring. You know, certainly the provider can do the monitoring and you know, feed that to law enforcement. But you hold the trump card. The victim says no, no really does mean no under this. So that is, that is absolute ironclad and the only way to override that is with the same old order that we could always get with a Title III wiretap order, probable cause, you know, yada, yada, yada. Which brings me to what is, the, what is one of the other big exceptions to the wiretap statute? Court authorized monitoring. This is a Fourth Amendment compliant court order. Got to go to a particular kind of judge, not just any old judge like the ones who can issue uh, search warrants. Those are called magistrate judges. I have to go to a judge with life tenure. So, you know, somebody who, you know, you know he's not going to be bounced out of office in five years unless he behaves well. This is somebody who is a constitutional so-called Article III judge. Um, and the statute requires that, not Fourth Amendment required. Got to show probable cause, there's a time limit on it. Uh, Got to show necessity. Uh, I have to minimize so I'm not collecting uh, lots of non-relevant communications. Uh, there's a limitation, you know, depending on what kind of offense you're investigating, maybe or maybe not, you can do a, a wiretap, and so on. So lots of protections, lots of court oversight, and as I said earlier, you know, statutory suppression in many cases for violations if you screw up on things like, for instance, to do a, a, a wire interceptor uh, at the federal level. It requires high level approval from someone within the Department of Justice. Uh, and there's a specified list of officials. If you go off that list, and there's a Supreme Court case on this called Giordano, then the stuff gets suppressed. And that's what this, the Supreme Court said in 1974. You know, the, the Attorney General's executive assistant cannot authorize wiretaps. If the AG does, the deputy AG, a certain other list of officials, that's okay. You go off the menu, evidence goes out. So lots of protections uh, if we're doing uh, monitoring under court authorization. Okay, so as a practical application, what does that mean? Uh, certainly since 1986, this includes things like cloning uh, pagers, uh, you know, whether they're text or numeric, uh, keystroking, the same sort of thing that you might be doing uh, on your network. Uh, uh, if we sort of move up the OSI stack, we, you know, we don't think so much about monitoring packets, but monitoring at the application layer, uh, collecting the email that comes into or goes out of a mail server destined for a particular uh, user account. Uh, so those are all instances where uh, we might seek a, a court order. In fact, I, I, except for pagers, I've, I've worked on uh, you know, all, of these kinds of, uh, all of these kinds of intercepts. Okay, so that's one box, and I realize I spent a long time going through it, but I think it's, it's sort of the biggie. Uh, acquisition of contents in real time, Title III order consent, there are those other exceptions. The thing that's changed is computer trespasser under USA Patriot. And I would suggest to you that that's, that's a very rational change, uh, not something that anybody needs to get excited about. Okay, so, uh, yeah? Um, you said that it was only available for specified offenses. Are these offenses categorized in terms of the extremity of punishment for the offense, or how are they? They're all felonies, among other things. Um, the, the, well, I'm sorry, the, the question was what are the predicate offenses for which you can do a wiretap? Uh, if you really want to go look at it, uh, it would be 18 U.S.C. section 2516, 1, 2, and 3. And uh, generally speaking, like at the state level, you know, murder, kidnapping, obviously narcotics. Uh, narcotics is, you know, for, for better or worse, the uh, bulk of the Title III's are done. A lot of those are done on pagers, of course. 
Uh, so you can go read the whole gory list for yourself. All right, let me, let me move on, uh, and if there's time at the end, I'll, I'll field any, uh, any other questions. Let's go to the second box. Stay in the real-time arena. So we're still talking about collecting records that are going to arise in the future. Uh, but we're talking about non-content now. Uh, the first legislation that addressed this was the Pen Trap Statute, enacted in 1986. And like the wiretap statute, this begins with a general prohibition. Thou shalt not install pen trap devices. There are some exceptions, again, for provider self-protection, consent of the customer, stuff like I want caller ID, um, and a court order. Now, here's what USA Patriot does or doesn't do in this realm. The 1986 statute was very, uh, sort of technology specific in its language. And you can see here the definition, for instance, of what a pen register is. Uh, basically numbers dialed on a telephone line. It talks about a device being attached to something else. And as we know, there's often uh, in the uh, packet switch context, there's no device attached. It's all running in software. So there's no, there's no attachment. Um, we're not really talking about numbers dialed. Uh, typically there's no telephone line anywhere in the picture. And so what the USA Patriot amendments to this statute have done is to make this technology neutral. Now, a lot of people have claimed that this is, in fact, a radical expansion of government monitoring authority. Uh, what I'm here to tell you is it hasn't changed what we do in practice one iota. Because before USA Patriot, we were relying on this exact same statute to do things like determine what IP address, you know, somebody is coming in from a, about a year ago on the, the Leaves Worm case. I, I wrote a, a trap and trace order on a compromised box uh, out in one part of the U.S., uh, out in the Southwest, to see where the connections were coming in from. And so it's not as if suddenly this opened the floodgates for something that had never been done before. We've been doing this, again, thinking about the OSI stack, we've been doing this for uh, things like IP addresses and ports, for things like you know, who's getting email addresses, uh, who's getting email from what email address, uh, who's sending email to what email address. So it really has is simply codified an existing practice. So instead of numbers dialed on telephone lines, what we now have is technology neutral language uh, that confirms the same rules apply to things like internet communication. So the language of the statute is now things like dialing, routing, addressing, and signaling information uh, explicitly but not content. And it now says that three places in the statute, uh, including two places where it did not say it before. Uh, obviously a constitutionally mandated requirement. These are not probable cause orders. So if I were to collect content intentionally under one of these orders, I would be violating the Fourth Amendment and stuff would get constitutionally suppressed entirely apart from the statutory framework. So this retains that same line that the courts have been drawing now for a good 30 years. And as I say, it codifies practice. Let me tell you one little story about a gentleman named James Atomic Dog Cop, uh, who it is alleged uh, shot to death a doctor in uh, Buffalo, New York about three and a half, four years ago. The um, doctor was a, an abortion provider. He was standing in the uh, kitchen at the back of his house and somebody with a high-powered rifle uh, killed him with a single shot from a wooded area behind uh, Dr. Slapian's house. Um, there was a lot of work done to figure out where cop was once he went on the lam. And about a year and a half ago, uh, the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office up in Buffalo got in touch with me and they had figured out that cop, wherever he was, and some associates of his in the U.S. who were basically helping him to remain on the run were communicating through a Yahoo email account. And they were using it in sort of a paranoid way, uh, not by sending email to each other in the normal sense, but they were basically using the account as a dead drop. One person logs in, they all have got the username and password. One logs in, composes a message, leaves it in the draft folder, logs out. The other person logs in from time to time, cop, wherever he is, checks the message, writes his own message, leaves it in the draft folder. So it really is a dead drop. Well, uh, I wrote a trap and trace order to see what IP address 
is he connecting into Yahoo from? Let's see all the connections for that particular Yahoo account. Who's logging into it? And sure enough, you know, we, we, we get the order signed by the court and immediately we see connections coming in from Ireland. Well, we know that our uh, co-conspirators are in Brooklyn, so it's not them. It's got to be COP. It shifts to France. Uh, almost immediately, so he's, he's on the move. And putting this together with some other information uh, allowed us to uh, tell the French authorities where he was going to be when. And he was ultimately arrested by the French police at the post office in Dinan uh, about a year and a half ago. Just last month, uh, he was finally extradited to the U.S. And obviously, these are all allegations. You know, nothing has been proven. You know, a cop is uh, presumed innocent until proven guilty. But these are very serious allegations. We're talking about a murder in violation of the Federal Access to Clinic Entrances Act. Uh, in some ways, you could consider this an act of political terrorism. Uh, in my view, and in the view of Congress, uh, as expressed through USA Patriot, it's important to be able to do the same kinds of things on the net that law enforcement has been able to do in the telephone network, in the circuit switch network, for a very long time. Uh, and just the fact that we were doing this, we were doing this a year and a half ago, I think tells you, once again, changes to USA Patriot really are codifying existing practice, not a sea change in terms of before and after. Okay, any questions on that? Yeah, shoot. If you speak up just a little bit, I heard the first part, but if technology gets in the way. Basically, what if this uh, guy's alleged to have killed abortion doctors and was using a uh, proxy? So technology made it much more difficult for somebody to make if he's, if he's using a proxy, well, um, then I may have to go to more than one provider with my order to do the tracing. And, I, you know, the, the connection may drop there may be no historical records after the fact. One of the interesting things, neither this statute nor any other statute uh, under U.S. law requires service providers, as a general rule, to retain records. So, you know, anonymizers, for instance, don't have to keep, I mean, that's, that's why many anonymizers do not keep records. There is no data retention within the U.S. Now, there's some limited exceptions. I know some of the telco tariffs require things for like, you know, IXC billing, but that's, that's sort of a, a, a funky historical exception because of the, the common carrier regulations of the FCC. Generally speaking, if you're, well, let's just say you're pure, you're, you're pure internet play, pure internet service provider, you don't gotta keep log one. If you just wanna keep no logs to begin with or throw them away after five hours or five days or five years, that's up to you. That's entirely a business judgment. And the only way that anybody can force you to start keeping those records is if they go get a court order. So, you know, in theory, somebody could get a court order and require uh, an anonymizer to start keeping connection records. One, that would require them to be in the U.S. and subject to U.S. process. Uh, two, uh, I would have to have some reason to believe that this is going to be continuing conduct. I mean, if it's a one-time threat email and it's not going to recur, it's not going to do me any damn good. It's really not going to further my investigation to, to put up uh, that sort of a trap and trace. Okay? All right. Uh, one more question on this and then I want to move on. How have you found this mail account? I'm, I'm sorry? The Yahoo mail account. The Yahoo mail account? Uh, that was obtained through some on-the-ground stuff, including some physical searches within the U.S. That's, that's how it was determined that they were sharing this. But it wasn't enough to disclose uh, where COP himself was or was likely to be. Uh, so what can a pen trap device collect? Well, stuff that's plainly included. Uh, historical things, the stuff that you know for decades has been the object of these, even before the 1986 pen trap statute. And remember, pen registers and trap and traces have been used since long before there was any statute. So even before 1986, before Congress passed that piece of ECPA, law enforcement was using pen register and trap and trace devices to get telco numbers basically because that was that was the communications network that existed. Um, I think plainly most email header information not subject again kind of a duh the subject header is content substance purport or meaning and uh, it's it's abundantly clear to me that if I were to use a 
uh, pen register or trap and trace device to collect that stuff, uh, that I would be running afoul of the wiretap statute. I would basically be doing a wiretap collection of future content without bothering with the niggling detail of actually getting the required order. And my stuff is going to be constitutionally suppressed. So most email header information, I think from I realize I know I, I teach a class on email header forgery, so I know that you know, I know the difference between you know RFC 2821 and RFC 2822. Uh, so I know from forgeries, but still we could collect it, you know, get the received headers, uh, and so on and so forth. And then once again, moving down the the OSI stack, uh, you know, things like uh, source and destination IP address and port, as in the COP case. Stuff that's plainly excluded, like I said, subject line of email. The content, the actual, the guts of the communication. So the body of the email, the substance of a file that's being FTP'd from one host to another, um, all that's going to be excluded. One change, and I think again, this is it's sort of interesting what has been ballyhooed about USA Patriot and the stuff that you never hear about. Something added in USA Patriot is some additional judicial oversight for when the device formerly known as Carnivore, now under the much less threatening name DCS-1000, uh, is applied to a public provider's packet switch data network. Basically, if we want to stick our own device on somebody's network to do a pen trap, as opposed to having the provider collect it, and I should, I should emphasize that the standard practice, I just had a conversation with a friend of mine here earlier today about you know, what, the, what the normal uh, procedure ought to be, it's to have the provider do the collection. The agents really don't want to be in your network, or at least I don't want them to be in your network, because you will be happier if they're not in your network. Certainly, folks like you who are here, mom and pop ISPs may be a little different, and that's where a lot of the problems have been. But you guys, I think, know how to collect information on your networks. You know where the choke points are. Uh, you know, you know where the devices are physically housed. So I think it's just better all around, and people will all come out with big smiles on their faces if you do it in conformity with a court order, as opposed to having us do it. But in those limited cases where law enforcement needs to apply its own device, typically because the provider just does not have the, the technical wherewithal, and believe it or not, they do exist, um, then in those circumstances, the agents who are doing the collection have to file with the court basically the take, what they collect. And what that permits is some judicial oversight over what's actually being collected. Like, are they using this thing to collect stuff that's outside the scope of the order, including stuff that may be content. This was, uh, this was an amendment that was insisted upon by uh, House Majority Leader Dick Armey, and uh, you know he's kind of an influential guy, so uh, this, this actually went into the final legislation. So what we have here is a further restriction on law enforcement, more judicial oversight. So in fact, in fact what we have here is a privacy enhancing uh, amendment to the statute and not a privacy destroying amendment. Uh, there's some additional penalties here. You guys have the slides, so let me not spend too much time on this, uh, but explicit civil and administrative sanctions, uh, minimum $10,000 civil damages for government violations, and then uh, you can go read section 2712 to your heart's content about the different levels of administrative review. If a court finds that somebody has violated the statute, then the agency has to take administrative action. If the agency fails, the inspector general within the agency then is supposed to look at it and take, a, take action uh, if uh, action is warranted. So again, lots of, lots of additional deterrent for people to step outside the bounds set by the statute. And that gives us the second box uh, in the matrix for real-time acquisition of the other stuff, the non-content records. Okay, I think I've got about 11 minutes here to rip through the rest of this. Let's see if we can do stored communications here real fast. The stuff that's on the other side of that 2x2 two two matrix the stuff that is kind of after the fact records. And the, the general concern here, the reason we even have this is Congress was concerned back in 1986 that if you didn't have a statute that the government could get access to all of this stuff just by using a subpoena, subpoena a grand jury subpoena. That's not a probable cause order. That's, uh, it's, it's, it's a fairly low threshold, you know, potentially relevant to the criminal investigation. And a very common, commonly used tool for stuff in the hands of third parties, like, you know, banks, for instance. You know, things get subpoenaed from banks all the time in uh, fraud investigations, for instance. So, what do we have? Um, 
there, there are actually some further uh, kind of subdivisions within the matrix. And as we, go, as we go through, you'll see that Congress has made even more fine-grained distinctions among the classes of information uh, that may exist in, in the historical realm. And the general rule here is that content gets, unsurprisingly, more protection than non-content. Uh, we have some uh, criminal penalties here, not, certainly not as robust as for uh, wiretap violations, but still some criminal penalties uh, for accessing somebody's stored communications without permission. And again, as with the wiretap statute, aggrieved parties can go sue, get $1,000 per violation minimum, plus attorney's fees, and in appropriate cases, punitive damages. So there are a number of sticks to use against people who transgress. Uh, looking at this from your perspective, not the government, but from the perspective of the provider, so now we're talking about your interaction with your users or customers, however you characterize them. If there is stored content sitting on your system, the statute has been construed, I think correctly, to say you can read it, whatever it is. Now, maybe you've got some contractual agreement with your uh, users that says you won't do that. And then if you violated that, you may be liable to them in contract. But putting aside some sort of contractual obligation there or some state statute that imposes additional restrictions, at least under the federal statute, it's okay. And there is case law on that. Um, this uh, Bohatch v. City of Reno case. And in addition, if you are a non-public provider, so think, you know, Exxon Mobil, uh, you know, some big corporation, you're not providing, uh, you don't look like a telephone company. You're providing service just to a limited class of people who have a special relationship with you, for instance, your employees. Not only can you read what is stored on your network, you can disclose it willy-nilly to anybody you want. Uh, whether that's to the Wall Street Journal, there's a case on that. Uh, you can disclose it to law enforcement if you choose. This is all permissive, nothing mandatory here. If you want to, you can, you don't gotta. Now, the rules are different, and I think you'll probably grasp intuitively why this is. If it's a public provider, so the AOL of the world, the MSN, the you know, Yahoo, uh, a public provider, generally speaking, cannot freely disclose customer contents. Now, once again, what we encounter here is a broad prohibition off the bat and then a bunch of exceptions. And in the interest of time, I'll just skip over because most of these really track exceptions that we already talked about in wiretap statute. Uh, so consent, rights or property, and so on. An additional one added in USA Patriot is if there is an imminent threat of death or serious injury to a person that requires immediate disclosure of the records, then the public provider may, not must, may disclose the content record. So there is one change added by USA Patriot. Uh, in some ways it sort of parallels uh, an emergency wiretap provision in the real-time collection. Uh, but it is a change, and so I, I, you know, I draw your attention to it. Uh, it was something that Congress deemed uh, a, a sensible change, a sort of harmonization within the statute. Okay, permissive disclosure. Now let's talk about non-content stuff. The rule is anybody, public or private, can disclose content records to anybody except the government. So, you know, they can market the hell, you, I, I should say you, can market the hell out of your customer non-content records. You know, how old they are, what their address is, what their telephone number is, and so on. To disclose to the government, either need an exception and rights or property, obviously. If you can disclose content, you should, you know, certainly be able to disclose non-content to the government to protect your rights or property. And again, this threat of death or serious bodily injury to a person. Um, and again, those are both permissive. You don't gotta, um, all, it, it's, it's that you may. Now, one other exception is, well, when the government, with appropriate authority from a court or otherwise, requires you to disclose stuff. And we have the same dichotomy, content and non-content, all governed by this one statute, 18 U.S.C. 2703. Uh, various kinds of process. We have search warrants for some things, uh, subpoenas, a much lower standard, not a probable cause for other things. And let me just sort of go through, I'm gonna skip, you guys have all of the, the slides here. 
Let me just cut to the chase and tell you what the rule is. For historical information that is basically in, uh, in an unopened state, it's sitting on a server, the user hasn't accessed it, the government wants to get it. We need to serve a warrant, and it's a funny kind of warrant, it's not a knock down the door and order everybody up against the wall warrant. It's a, here's my subpoena, only it's really more than a subpoena because I had to go to a judge and I had to show probable cause that this stuff was relevant to a criminal investigation. Uh, so I have to use a warrant for unopened email on the provider's system, generally speaking. Uh, if I want other kinds of content, say the files sitting in the home directory, maybe the non-world readable files in the, you know, the web directory, I can get that with a variety of tools. One of them is uh, I can use a grand jury subpoena and there's some elaborate rules. I have to at some point give notice to the customer that I have done that. And then the last bit, and I, I apologize, this is, this is so positively, I'll, I'll use the word one of the earlier speakers today used, Byzantine, but I'm just, I'm just here to, to deliver the news of what Congress has done. For the non-content historical categories, we have a further subdivision, yet another dichotomy, that's why I call this dichotomies are us, between what's called subscriber information, stuff that really goes to identifying the person, and transactional records. So with the subpoena, I can get some basic stuff that identifies pretty much who the person is. There's one outlier in this list. I, I would concede that local and long distance telephone toll billing records is more transactional in nature. That's less who is the person and more what is the person doing. Um, but it's been like that since 1986, so USA Patriot has nothing to do with that, uh, if you will, discontinuity um, in the statute's function. What USA Patriot did do was say, if I use a subpoena, one of the lower forms of legal process, then I can, in addition to getting those other things like name and address, also find out what's the credit card number being used by Mickey Mouse to pay for the domain name that he registered uh, or the AOL account that he signed up for. And also things like uh, basically radius logs, dynamic IP assignments, uh, you know, DHCP logs, whatever they are. On the other side, the stuff that doesn't just go to identifying the person, but sort of talks about what the person has been doing. You know, who do they send email to for the last 30 days? Uh, you know, who has been hitting their website? For that, I need to get a particular kind of court order called the 2703D court order. And it's kind of midway between a subpoena and a warrant. Uh, I don't have to show probable cause, but I gotta go in front of a judge. I have judicial oversight. Um, and the judge has, basically has discretion to deny my application. Now this has been around since 1994, and this is another interesting artifact of CALEA. CALEA actually added some privacy protections. It used to be I could get all this stuff with a subpoena. Today, you know, both pre and post Patriot Act, to get most log information, transactional records, I gotta use this kind of court order. So as I say, go before a judge, actually tell a story, not just make a certification, but say, here are the reasons why, and you tell me if I've actually met the relevant legal standard or not. So that's the last box in the matrix. Historical, non-content, obviously, you know, subpoena and 2703D court order, those are lower requirements than a warrant, but unsurprisingly, that's because we're talking there about not content, but non-content stuff. And if you want to view this in sort of a different way, if you kind of you know, take it into a one-dimensional model, we can think of the forms of process that law enforcement has to use as kind of a totem pole. A warrant is required for certain things. With a court order, I can get uh, more things like transactional logs, and with a subpoena, I can only get uh, uh, excuse me, I, I, I'm misphrasing that. With a subpoena, I can get a certain limited class of information. If I go up to this court order, I can get, in addition, transactional logs. If I want to get the whole Megillah, including the person's unopened email, got to use a, uh, a warrant that basically looks like a Fourth Amendment warrant. And obviously, you know, the warrant is good for all that stuff down below as well, assuming I can establish probable cause. Uh, one last word here, 2703F, request to preserve. There is one provision in the statute that says the government can come to you and say, look, I don't have my subpoena, court order, search warrant, whatever it is, yet. But I think I'm gonna go get one, and in the meantime, 
I need you to preserve some records because I know just how ephemeral network records are. And you may cycle out your, uh, your radius logs every five days, every eight days. I don't know what it is and I don't want to, to my chagrin, find that, that when I finally come to you with my legal process that those records no longer exist. So I can ask you to hold on to stuff. Don't you delete it and please don't let the customer delete the only copy that may exist. Uh, so that might include things like email sitting on a server. This is not something that entitles me to get it. This is just a freeze order. Hang on to it, because I'm going to be back. Not give it to me on my say-so. And this, this letter really is just a say-so. It's not issued you know, under authority of a court. If I were going to a court, I would get the order that says give it to me. One question that comes up here is, does this have prospective effect? And I realize I'm running over time here. Give me one more minute, and I promise to wrap up. The answer, I think, is hell no, this doesn't have prospective effect. Because if this had prospective effect, I could come to you with a 2703F letter and say, you know what, you've got this customer. I think he's a bad dude. Would you just like collect his email for the next 90 days and then you can turn it over to me when I come to you with my warrant in three months? Well, that's great, except what did I just do? I just asked you to wiretap somebody, only I kind of forgot to go through that you know, tiny sort of technical requirement of complying with the Fourth Amendment, the wiretap statute, and so I've got a problem. So I don't want you complying prospectively with F request. The F request is if you got it now, save it. What you do in the future, you know, don't change your practices on account of me. You know, if you want to change your, your data retention policy going forward for your own reasons, more power to you. But that's not what I'm asking with the F letter. The F letter is a snapshot in time, not collect lots of stuff going forward. Because I think there are some serious constitutional issues with anybody doing that. It could subject me to suppression of evidence. If that happened, it could subject a provider to liability from the person whose records are collected under that authority. So uh, there are people who think it's prospective in effect. Uh, I, I'm inclined to rain on their parade. Okay, uh, you have this slide, kind of the summary of the notable changes on, on USA Patriot. Uh, I would just wrap with saying, uh, if you're interested in more on this, including lots and lots of gory lawyer-like detail on USA Patriot and all things cybercrime, you can go to my section's website, cybercrime.gov, and uh, read stuff to your heart's content. Uh, I'm done. Enjoy your coffee. Thanks very much for your time.